Hello, Global Gardeners. It's Monday. I'm back. Thank you for your patience as we missed last week's live. But we're here today, and I'll be here next week and the weeks in the foreseeable future. So it was just a little break for all of us. So nice to have you all here. So nice to get together and start our gardening week in the way that we all like to do it on this Monday. And today I want to talk about other people's gardens and how you get out there and can learn from the gardeners around you. First, a quick shout out to Sunset Gazing, to Shiloh Walker and Mary Brewster, new members of the Gardener Scott community. It's so great to have you all part of this wonderful membership on the channel and look forward to seeing you on some of those perk areas that we offer. Let's go ahead and start with a question that Sally Anderson is asking does anyone know about comfrey and milk, milk thistle seeds coincidentally i do do you need to wait until fall to plant the seeds in hopes they'll come up next year or can i try now so the thing about both comfrey and milk thistle seeds is that they will benefit from cold stratification these are the kind of seeds and there's a lot of perennials that we grow in our gardens when the seeds need a cold period for them to germinate best. And cold stratification does make a difference. You can expect that the comfrey seeds and the thistle seeds will germinate better if you've put them in the refrigerator and given them a month or six weeks of that cold exposure. But it's not absolutely necessary. It improves germination. And so some of these seeds may be difficult to germinate. And if you cold stratify them, you can expect to maybe get 80 or 90% germination. That's usually about what I tend to get with a lot of these type of perennial seeds. If you don't cold stratify, you might only get 10 or 20% germination. Sometimes better, a lot of it depends on how the seeds were stored at the seed company and how you've stored them since you got them. And so, yes, you can go ahead and start some now, and you can expect that you can get some germination. But if you want the most germination, then sowing them either in the fall outside so that they are in the ground all winter and then will germinate naturally next spring as soil warms up, that's definitely a consideration, or keep them stored and put them in the refrigerator before putting them outside. And you, you can try to do the cold stratification now and then just put them in a pot, get them growing and transplant that pot out to wherever you want to grow these plants. Late summer, early autumn, that's, that's not ideal because it may or may not give the plant enough time to really get established before winter comes, but it's it's worth a try. So totally up to you, lots of options when you have those seeds that need that, that cold stratification. And that's one reason why uh, planning ahead and, and understanding how that whole process works with the cold exposure can make it easier at this time of year, those of us in spring that are looking for our plants to be growing. Cheesecake says, I have three comfrey plants and heard it's difficult to grow comfrey from seed. And that's a big reason why. Because most people don't, most new gardeners in particular, but even some experienced gardeners, don't fully understand that seeds like that need that exposure to cold. So they'll save their seed, they'll put them in an envelope and store them like they do every other seed, and then wonder why it doesn't germinate. And they get the 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 reputation for being difficult to grow often just that exposure to cold can make all the difference in the world so give that a try and see if it works hello to terry t's home and garden in victoria bc nice to have you here overcast for you this morning and we actually uh, speaking of VC and Canada, I've been gone all week, so I'm just catching up. But there's a lot of Canadian fires, and the wind is blowing down here into Colorado. And so we look like we're overcast today, but it's actually 
lot of the smoke build up in the air. And so it's, it's one of those things here in the Rocky Mountains we're used to with smoke from wildfires blowing in for a number of years now. But uh, this is the first I remember in a while where it's actually coming down from Canada. So yeah, it's a bit overcast here as well. Sally is saying, putting the, the seeds in the fridge now. And Tanya is saying, good morning, where can I get comfrey? So there's a few places you can look online, um, and, and, and I'm sure some of you will jump in with the suggestions. There are some herbal uh, seed companies that I know sell comfrey. And I, I know this question comes up occasionally, and I can never remember the name. So it's the comfrey seed is that I've found is only available through some of the smaller herbal and medicinal seed companies. It's not sold by the big seed company. So a simple search should be able to give you an idea of where they're coming from. And I'm sure that some others here will go ahead and throw out that information to help you out. I, if you can, and this is one of those things, and this kind of ties in with the, the subject at hand today. If you can find somebody who's growing comfrey because all the comfrey I have, and I think I've got six or eight plants throughout my landscape, I've propagated it from roots. It grows very easily by just taking a root cutting and then the plant will emerge from that. So if you can find someone who has comfrey, doing it from the root, much easier, much better, much more guaranteed to get a plant than from collecting the seed. The seed needs all that extra effort to, to get a plant out of it. Whereas the, the, the plant that you can get either a division of a comfrey plant or just a little finger sized chunk of a root will give you all the comfrey you need for years to come. Steve OO or Steve O or Steve Videotape. Thank you for that contribution. Help trying to grow fruit trees in limestone soil. And so um, th this is one of those situations, depending on, on the fruit trees that you're going to grow and depending on, on how uh, limey your soil is as well. If it's a, a really high pH, that could pose a problem. This is one of those things, and this is kind of the approach I'm taking, taking because while my soil isn't a limestone soil, it is a higher pH soil. And so what I've done with my fruit tree area is to mulch with five to six inches of wood chip mulch. And over time, as the wood chips break down and as all of that organic material works its way into the soil, it will gradually improve the entire area. My soil is also very dense when it's dry. And the mulch also helps keep the soil moist which allows the roots to grow through it more easily. And so I know that can be a problem if your lime soil is, is dense and compacted like that. Keeping it moist really can help. You can go out and try to amend the soil as deeply as you can by putting organic matter in it. But the way trees grow and as far out as the roots will spread, I generally encourage that you just try to grow the trees in your native soil without amending and then add layers of compost on top of the soil. You can add chicken manure or other animal manure, manures and then on top of that add those thick layers of mulch and gradually the soil will improve over time and as those fruit tree roots begin to grow out they'll encounter more and more moist and nutritious conditions. And that's, that's one of the disadvantages of trying to grow fruit trees in really poor soil is it either takes a lot of work before planting where you try to amend everything. And I think a lot of times that's just wasted effort or it takes a lot of work after the fact by trying to improve the soil the best you can from the top down. But that will encourage a lot of soil life when you have those organics on top of the soil. And then I just did this a few weeks ago, my neighbor has chickens. They were cleaning out the coop and I always get all of the, the chicken droppings along with the, the, the wood 
uh, shavings that they use as part of their bedding. I do the same thing with my daughter when she cleans out her coop. And then I spread that around my fruit trees. And so within the drip line and a little bit farther out, I'm adding the material that has the chicken manure and the wood shavings that will be breaking down as well. So I'm always trying to, to throw that kind of stuff around my fruit trees and it, it does tend to help. And so for, for both of those ideas, let's go ahead and move into to the topic of discussion today. One of the most beneficial things I think you can do is to visit someone else's garden. Ideally, in your area so that you can see how other art gardeners are dealing with some of the issues you have. And so I've noticed that some of the gardens I visited in my, my nearby area are also trying to grow fruit trees and having a really hard time with it. And they're not doing anything extra. They just put their plants in the ground and are wishing for the best. I was just out this morning checking my fruit trees and this is the third year for most of those trees and I've got blossoms on almost all the trees. Some of them are just beginning to bud and I'm hoping the blossoms will emerge soon. And so to see the difference in a garden like someone else's garden versus my garden, if you were trying to grow fruit trees, you'd come to my garden and say, wow, I can't do this. Well, yes, you can. It just takes a little bit extra effort. And me going to someone else's garden, I can see, yes, it really is worth the effort. I can see that what I'm doing is making a difference. Now, of course, everyone would love to go to Gardner Scott's garden, and there's a lot of other gardens like that, but it's not just me. There are lots of gardeners and lots of areas that you can learn from. And it's, it's as simple as how they put their beds together, how they space their beds, what kind of soil they use, their choice of plants. Everybody's different and everybody has successes. And I think we can all learn from somebody else. I've just in the last week did a tour in a Colorado garden and did a tour in a Connecticut garden. Both wonderful gardens. And I learned from both gardens. It doesn't matter where the garden is that you're walking through. I encourage that you get out there and walk through a garden. So I'd love to have all of you give uh, what you found. If you visited another garden, give us some of the tips that you might have picked up from someone else that you would have never known if you hadn't ventured into someone else's garden. Too often I think we, we are a little self-conscious of our efforts and maybe we're more humble than we should be and we don't like to share our garden with others because we're worried about the criticisms that, that we might receive. Well, that rarely, if ever, happens. If someone's touring your garden, they're going to say nice things. And when you're touring someone else's garden, say nice things. And so it really becomes one of those experiences when you invite someone into your garden, not only to make a, a new or better gardener friend, but also to get the, the support that you'd love to have when they see what you're do doing and say, I love that idea, or I really like that, or I'm going to try that in my garden. And, and I always try to do that. I'm always picking up something from, from people all around the area whenever I can, I can find it. High Plains Drifters asking, how late can you plant potatoes? I live in uh, Southwest Kansas and, and looking at planting a late summer garden around the middle of July timeframe. Yeah, so a lot of it depends on, on the potato, whether it's uh, a, a potato that, that is early and, and you can harvest before the cold cold comes. But you should be able to get a fall garden of potatoes. And so when you, with any plant, not just potatoes, but you have to look at the days to harvest that, that come with either the seed potato package or you might have to do some extra research online or with the seed packet if you're doing other types of vegetables. And then take the days to harvest, figure out when your first frost date is in fall, use that as a basic guideline and then back up. So if you're growing potatoes that need 80 days, then 
look at whenever you're expecting that first frost to hit in fall and back it up 80 days. Now, potatoes can handle some frost, but if you can expose them to good growing conditions that aren't too cold, then they'll grow better. Nice thing about potatoes is once you see the flowers on your potato plant, that's showing that the tubers are growing underground. And so from any point after that flower development until the plant completely flops over brown and dead above the surface, you can harvest the potatoes. So use, use your first frost date as a general guideline, understanding how long it takes the specific potato variety that you're growing to reach that point. And then recognize that if you have a early frost and it kills off the foliage of the plant, you can still dig it up and harvest it. You'll just have smaller tubers at that time. And so I'm guessing middle of July for you is probably a good target to be able to get some of that growth. And my guess is it'll probably uh, give you exactly what you're looking, just a different or just a matter of the size of the potato that you'll be harvesting at that point. The patch says, that's how I started my little garden. Your channel's inspired me to try and it's been so much fun learning. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. At the patch. Yeah, I, I, that's one reason why I like to show my garden in my videos and of course why I highlight other people's gardens during the, the live stream because it is to encourage and it is to give you all ideas of what you can do and and what what maybe I can't do, but just because it's something I can't do in my garden, I always try to point out that it is an option for other areas that might be able to have a longer season or better soil or better weather conditions or whatever it happens to be. Riverdale Garden says, being a letter carrier on a walking 13 mile route, I get to observe many gardens and flower beds I've learned a lot chatting with folks as well. There you go. And that's exactly the, the, the point. I used to love my last house. We had a lot of people walking and I completely redid the front of, of the house. And you can see that in some of my videos about, about mulch and uh, pruning ornamental grasses. And I've got a few videos that I shot in the front of that house. And as I was working on all of that, people would walk by and they'd stop and they'd say, oh, I really like what you're doing. And we'd chat and I, I wouldn't necessarily treat it as an educational opportunity. I would treat it as, hey, this is someone new in the neighborhood. I'll get to, to meet them. And no doubt those that were gardeners went home and saw what I was doing because they often ask questions about what I was doing. And it was an opportunity for them to maybe try something similar in their landscape. So just walking around your neighborhood and talking to other gardeners and stopping to look at other yards, that's a great way to learn a lot about what's happening in your area, about what's working, what's not working, get plant ideas. And, and you may even find someone that's growing comfrey and they're more than willing to dig down a little bit and pull out a chunk of root and give it to you for comfrey and all kinds of other plants. I also think it's a great idea. And this is one of the things that that I, I like to do as well when I locally go around to other gardens, particularly towards the end of the season, sharing seeds. All of us who are collecting seeds have way more seeds that we co we collect than that we can actually use. And so rubbing elbows with a gardener in your neighborhood after an afternoon walk may give you some seeds at the end of the walk to add to your inventory and then put into your garden for the next year. So lots of advantages to getting out and about and seeing all that fun kind of stuff and other people's gardeners or gardens as gardeners. Bird Marie Organic says, people in my neighborhood don't really do raised bed gardening. I've learned everything to trial and error and other YouTube channels. But I wouldn't be surprised in this case, Bruce, if other people in your area maybe start doing some raised beds. They'll see what you're doing with raised beds and maybe they just don't know it yet that that's a viable option for them. And so I, I've seen that there's you, you've probably gone to some of those neighborhoods where where a lot of the yards look alike. Well, often it's that one person that starts doing it a particular way 
and then others see how nice it looks and they copy it, maybe modify it a little bit. But yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if you don't start seeing some some raised beds in other areas. And that may be one way for you to spread the knowledge that, that you're gaining to a lot of others. Shandy's Garden says, can I literally mulch pile on top of my potatoes with just about any organic matter? They're in ground and taking off, but I want to maximize the yield. What if I don't mount? So in my video on potatoes, I talk about there being two types of potatoes, just like there's two types of tomatoes. There's determinate and there's indeterminate. And so if you're growing a de determinate type of potato, mounding isn't going to do any good. And it's really not necessary. If it's an indeterminate type of potato that will continue to produce tubers all the way up and down the stem, then adding a mound to it can help. And it really doesn't matter that much because the primary roots are growing in the soil and the tuber just needs that nice moist environment for it to grow. The actual potato is not absorbing the nutrients from the soil. So it can grow in virtually any moist medium. And it's been a while and I've been wanting to do it again to make a video. And last time I did it, I didn't make a video, but you may have heard of potato towers. And I've grown potatoes in towers before that once you put the seed potato in the soil, you wrap that area with, with metal fencing. I just use welded wire fencing to make a, a cylinder. And then as the plant grows, you mound around it. And all I've used when I make my potato towers is a blend of straw and compost. Because you're not trying to feed the plant. You're just trying to give space for those tubers to grow. And so to your specific question, it really doesn't matter what kind of organic matter you're using. I, I like to use organic matter that once I harvest the potatoes, what's left behind will benefit next year's bed. And so when I would do my, my potato towers around the garden, I did this at the Galileo School, I would grow the potatoes in a tower in an area that next year I wanted better soil in. So all of that compost and all of that straw that the potato plants were growing in, we would harvest and then just spread all of that organic matter to help enrich the soil for the following year. So that's one way of approaching it. And that's why I just use whatever the organic matter is that, that, that you think will be beneficial. Uh, but do check on the type of soil because even the indeterminate potatoes really don't need mounding. The mounding will just give you more potatoes. And the more potatoes overall means the smaller the potatoes are overall. So if you want really big tubers, then don't mound at all. And all the plant's energy are going to go into the, that initial set of tubers. As you mound and as more tubers begin to grow, it's taking energy from the plant, which means the earlier potatoes will not get as large and the later potatoes will actually be pretty small. So up to you as to whether you want one big crop or you want a lot of different sizes in your in your potatoes. Sandy's saying, I have radishes ready to harvest. Can I reseed for a second crop? Oh yeah, absolutely. Radishes are, are one of those plants that are ideal for succession planting. Harvest plant, harvest plant, and they grow so quickly that you can get multiple crops of radishes in the same space over the course of a growing season. During the, the heat of summer, depending on where you live, they, they might bolt early and you might not get really good radishes. And so I tend to put some different plants into that spot for the, the summertime that can handle it. But absolutely, go ahead and, and reseed for another crop and, and, and get more radishes. And if you are, this is kind of how I handle the succession planting. Uh, with something like radishes. I'll plant radishes in bed number one, harvest seed again in bed number one, 
and then because of the heat of summer I'm not gonna be growing as many radishes I'll put in a plant like cucumbers or squash in bed number one and then go about the rest of the garden well in in bed number two when I've got some of the taller plants growing like the tomatoes on a trellis I'll put in some radish seeds in the shade of those taller plants and then harvest those radishes and then towards the end of the season when it's cooling down and the cucumbers and the squash aren't producing fruit anymore I'll pull them out and I'll put radishes back in bed number one so by choosing the, the different beds and using shade to your advantage radishes can be grown pretty much throughout the season for most of us so uh, yeah give it a try you might find out that you're getting sick of radishes but it's definitely something that you should be able to to grow as often as you possibly can so green leaf gardening says hi hopefully i can become a regular live stream viewer i am mostly done with school for the summer i'm looking forward to learning more about gardening awesome well i hope you can become a regular viewer over the course of the summer you can always watch everything on replay i think this is number 160 of our live streams so we've been doing this for a couple years now and there's a lot that you can look on live stream to to see and if you happen to miss the live back in or back when we get into the school season just just review what you can but yeah i'd love to have you here on a regular basis over the course of the summer and learning from this incredible group of people we have shout out as always to jay and heidi our wonderful moderators who know an awful lot and they're also great at answering questions as they pop up so this is a great group to learn from and speaking of jay re raised beds i have slowly caused more gardeners in the community garden to switch to raised mounds and raised beds there you have it that's what we were talking about earlier with the idea being that when someone sees a good idea they're more likely to want to do it when you can explain what you've done you can demonstrate what you're doing and they're like yeah i kind of like that idea i've 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 seen that in my channel over the years i love raised beds i do most of my gardening in raised beds and i can't tell you the number of comments i've gotten from people that have said they didn't garden in raised beds till they saw my videos and now they're doing the same thing they're doing most of their gardening in raised beds so you just need to, to see it and thank you for that jay being the good example that you always are it definitely makes a difference as to uh, how you want to to do things zx vixen my husband had the pleasure of overhearing a grandmother and grandchild walk by my garden state how wonderful it looked and how much it made them want to grow things made my day isn't that wonderful that is fantastic that's that's one of those things that i that i i i it made your day it made your week it made your month and i'm sure it's one of those things you probably won't soon forget so good for you to have a garden that you're willing to to share with others and, and good for you that they're willing to comment on that i think that's absolutely fantastic so glad to hear that so uh gardens happen says i bet that tower would work for sweet potatoes uh yeah no reason why it shouldn't now sweet potatoes are a different type of plant and the thing about the sweet potatoes is unlike potatoes most sweet potatoes will root on the 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 stem on the upper portion and that will help spread the plant so that is a possible way that you can grow sweet potatoes in a tower like that as well it it grows slightly differently um, but the basic effect is going to be the same so uh, give it a try the towers uh, I'm not planning on doing it this year but maybe I'll add that to my list next year of what I'm going to be doing and things I'll be showing maybe I'll plan to do some of the the towers so you can see uh, not that I want you to wait a whole year I heard since I just told you about it but it is one of those things that making a video about it definitely will make a difference for those of us who want to try something new and that is one of those kind of things that I like to try two gals on the homestead I completed the UVM master gardener course last week good for you I couldn't have made it with through without Gardner Scott and this great community that's awesome congratulations Gail I'm so glad that you were 
able to complete it. I know I can remember back, what was it, about a year ago, you were talking about having an interest in it and then going through the, the whole process to get selected and do the classes. So uh, that's neat. The, uh, I'm guessing you have the volunteer phase that's beginning and you'll be doing some more work with the, the Master Gardener crew, but that, that's a big accomplishment. And, and as you'll probably uh, second and, and be willing to share with others, one of the things about going through the Master Gardener course is that you learn a lot, but it really is good at identifying what you don't know and how much more you need to learn to actually feel as, as comfortable in gardening as you, you will. But that's a major accomplishment and, and kudos to you for having completed it. And the journey continues. I, I encourage everyone as much as possible to get into a program like that if you can. It really is a lot of fun. Shandy's Gardener says, gardeners do know how to take what they need and apply it like fertilizer for the brain. Yeah, get those ideas growing. And it's one of those things that the, the, the kind words from others walking by your garden, the, the information we learn from other gardens, the information that we can give to other gardeners as we see them in their gardeners, that's all fertilizer for the brain. That's all that, that nutrition that our brain cells need to get us moving in the right direction and to keep us happy along the way. So... Uh, I like that. That That's one of the things that's so nice about this community. You all are so encouraging of others and are definitely helping us all fertilize our brain. And I'm doing the best I can along those lines, too. Okay, let's see. I want to... Well, it looks like there's In the Garden with Eli and Kate. I saw that she had said she'd be doing mostly listening today, but... Nice to see that you're joining in on the conversation as well. Idaho Gardener, Gardener Scott, explain the life cycle and planting times for large sweet onions. Uh, and so uh, first off, when you talk onions, you really need to understand short day, long day, and then in between that, the intermediate day varieties. And so the way that the onions work is they are very sensitive to the amount of sunlight. And so when you live in an area that, that gets shorter days, so in the United States, that's the southern part of the United States. During the summer, the northern United States have longer days than the southern United States. And there are different varieties of onions that correspond to the latitude that you're growing your onions at. And you can carry that same idea across the planet at different latitudes. Now you have areas like the UK, for instance, uh, like in, in Scotland and Wales and England that are all pretty much about the same latitude. And so when you see a, 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 a video on growing onions in an area like that, they're all growing the same basic type of onion. There's not a lot of variety. But when you come to the United States and you're talking about growing a Walla Walla onion, what, that comes from Walla Walla, Washington, it's a long day variety. And you attempt to grow that same onion in Arizona or Texas or Florida, you're probably not going to get good results because you really do need to recognize a difference in the variety. And so that sun exposure and that lengthening of days is what really causes the bulb to start growing. If you grow the wrong kind of onion in the wrong place, you're probably not gonna get good bulb development. And so matching it up is really critical to this. So when you're talking about large sweet onions, you need to match it with your region and that should give you the biggest bulb. Onions can be sown and can start growing if you put in sets of onions while it's still cool outside. That's another part of the life cycle is to get them growing as early as possible so that they can be triggered by the amount of hours of sunlight in the day and then start getting that big bulb development. And of course, doing that in a nice, good, rich, 
soil that's got all the nutrients for the plants and then keeping it nice and moist, that's all you're looking for. So those are the key components to get that, that big sweet onion. It's, it's just making sure you, you have selected the variety before you even started growing it and making sure it matches with your region and then getting it in the ground as early as possible and leaving it in the ground as, as late as possible un until you start seeing some of those, those outer leaves start to die off and that's the indication that the skin of the onion is beginning to harden. Each, each of those leaves corresponds with one of the onion layers inside that, that bulb. And so when you, if you harvest too early, the outer part of the onion is still going to be soft. Whereas if you wait till those outer leaves start to die off, that's telling you that the, the skin of the onion has developed underground. Then you harvest and you need to season it for a while. After you harvest your onions, you should let them set. Most gardeners like to do it outside. So you harvest and then just lay the onions right down on the mulch in the same bed and let them season in the in the sun for a few days and then bring them inside. That really helps the onion skin harden and protect the plant. If you harvest too early and you don't give that seasoning, then it, it, they don't store as well because that outer those outer layers tend to be a little bit softer and that's really what helps protect the plant. So hope that helps. A few ideas on on growing the onions and and from start to finish it, it should give you success if you uh, take the time and and make it work to your advantage. Laura's saying I've noticed my poor producing raised bed has shrunk the least not at all and my best producing garden shrinks a lot so I add compost. How do I add compost to a full bed? And so this gets back to what I was talking about early on with the fruit trees. I use compost as mulch a lot of times in those kind of beds. And so you can't work that compost into the soil when there are plants or when plants are actively growing in it. But instead of mulching with straw or with leaves or with some other material that hasn't broken down yet, I mulch with compost. And so it's already broken down or mostly decomposed. And as I water, those nutrients are, are flowing into the bed. But more importantly, the soil organisms, the, the arthropods and the earthworms in, in particular that are burrowing into that garden bed, they'll carry a lot of that organic matter from the top into the soil. It's not as effective as amending the soil, as blending it in. But this, this is what is, it, the idea of no-dig gardening is basically all about. You just continue to feed the soil from the top by adding compost on a regular basis and then let nature gradually incorporate that organic matter from the top into the soil. It, a lot of it depends on the soil. If you're starting with a soil that isn't high, in organic matter to start, it takes longer. If you do it with a soil that's already high in organic matter, it doesn't take as long because a lot of that soil life is already there. So that's that's really the easiest way. You can scratch it in after you add it to the top. You can take your little cultivator tool, that little tool with three prongs, and you can scratch it into the top of the soil and that'll help accelerate it a little bit. But uh, it just adding it to the top. And it's one of those things that you may notice uh, improvements relatively quickly. It is pretty surprising how that happens. Let's see, I'm trying to scroll down and catch up to where I was. Big Will Dog 82, I have a new critter hole that decimated my spring garlic in my tomato bed. What should I do? So ideally, try to identify what the critter is. If it's a gopher or if it's a hedgehog or if it's a rabbit or some other type of pest that that might be eating. When you know what the pest is, then you can begin to take corrective action. Maybe not for this year, especially if you, you've already lost a lot of your spring garlic, but maybe for the future. It also does give you an opportunity. So if it's a rabbit, for instance, you can 
recognize that that pest just needs to be kept out of the bed. So covering it with hoops and bird netting or fabric or something as a barrier to keep the rabbit out will keep your garlic from being eaten again. If it's a burrowing animal, like a gopher or a mole or a vole or uh, in whatever you might happen to have in your area, it offers other issues that you'll have to do. Big reason I grow in raised beds is because I can put a hardware cloth metal fabric at the base of my bed to keep the gophers from burrowing into my beds. So that might not help you this year, but that could be a project for the future. If you recognize that that's the kind of animal pest you have that's burrowing from underneath, then you'll need to put some type of barrier at the bottom. So it's all about barriers when you're dealing with animal pests and the type of barrier will be different determined by the type of animal that is doing the damage to your plant. So uh, take a close look at that area and try to see if you can uh, identify the tracks the, the paw prints, whatever you can. Also, depending on how the plant is eaten, you can go online and see some good photos of what the different animals will leave behind. And so deer will chew a plant differently than a rabbit will, for instance. And so you can look at the damage on the plant and that can help identify what kind of animal pest uh, you have. But in the, in the short term, Try to, to figure out what it is, and that can give you ideas as you move forward in trying to control that animal. And in most cases, it's going to be that you have to, to, to separate them and just keep them away from where they want to go in your garden. Green leaf gardening, how are your worm bins going? Are you going to make a new video on them? Um, they're going great. And so I... I was going to do a, a standalone video, but instead what I've been doing is just incorporating the idea. So you may have noticed if you've seen uh, my videos in recent months as I was potting up my plants and as I was talking about seedlings, this year's discussion includes me saying that I'm adding worm castings to my mixes, whereas in the past... I didn't have as much of the worm castings, and so it wasn't part of my normal potting soil blend. And so that's what I've done this year. They're going great. I'm getting a, a lot of worm castings. And so I'm right now using it as the, the blend for my potting soils. And my plan, to, to your question, is to, over the course of this growing season and then next fall, when I'm not actively making a lot of potting mix, I'm going to store up the worm castings and then I'll make a video next year that'll talk about using the worm castings outside in your garden as, as a, uh, a worm casting tea or extract to help add some nutrients around your plants and then also as an amendment to the soil. So that's coming as I get more and more of the worm castings. You can expect to see that, but they're doing great. They're, they're happy. I think I've mentioned before, my, my one granddaughter really likes to, to look at the worms. So whenever they come over, it's one of the first things we do is go down and open up the, the top of the bins so they can see all the worms crawling around. It's, it's a lot of fun for them. A lot of fun for me too, of course. But uh, I, I really like it when the grandkids get involved and decide that it's one of those things that they want to, to get involved with. Sandy's wondering, can you recommend a type of mulch for a raised bed? Yeah, my, my favorite raised bed mulches are straw, crushed leaves, and dried grass clippings. And then, as I said earlier, compost. And, and when I use compost as a mulch, I tend to use a chunkier compost. It's not fully decomposed. And those are the big four. Now, in my area, and I, I've said this in a number of videos, the the wind coming through my area if i just put leaves they blow away if i just put straw it blows away and so i actually blend straw and crushed leaves and grass clippings and that's the mulch i use in most of my beds and i show that in in more than a few videos because that's what i recommend it's 
It's usually available. Most of us have it. It's free as long as you collect it and it works great. And then at the end of the season, I just work that into the soil and let it break down over the course of the fall and winter and spring. And then that bed has been amended for the next season. And so it, it's really easy. An organic mulch like that uh, is easy. And and I use, I use the different parts of that at different times. So when I start seeds outside, I don't initially have any mulch, like a thick layer of mulch that you would think of, but I will sprinkle some dried grass clippings on that soil just to help keep it a little bit moister and the, the seedlings can just pop right through it. And then as those seedlings grow, I'll then add the straw and the the, the crushed leaves as the plants get bigger. But I've, I've got um, I've got other videos where I, I show that process and talk about it. So you'll be able to, to see that in some of the things that, that I've shown in the past. So uh, a lot of talking going on today. So nice to, to see everything that you have. Diana too is wondering, can I leave Jeruz Jerusalem artichokes in the ground and not harvest? Oh yeah, absolutely. This holds true for most plants that we grow in our garden. You can definitely leave them in the ground. Some, like the Jerusalem artichoke, you can actually leave them in the ground as, as like a, a storage opportunity. You might not harvest them when they would normally be harvested. Leave them in the ground and you might get another harvest a month or even later than that once you decide that you want to use the Jerusalem artichoke or leave them in the ground and they'll spread. That's one of those plants that can actually spread pretty easily in the garden if you just leave them in the ground. So yeah, don't feel for any plant that you, you have to harvest it, that you have to take it out. You might surprise yourself. There's a lot of plants we grow that we don't even realize are biennial plants. And so by leaving them in the ground over the winter, in their second season, they'll give you seeds. And that's what I did with a number of the onions I grew last year. I left the onions in the ground with the intent this year of collecting the onion seeds. And of course, making a video about it and, and a definite intent of leaving that plant in the ground. A lot of times it's an accident that a plant gets left in the ground and then it comes back the next year and might surprise you that you didn't know that those kind of plants will survive. If you are lucky enough to live in a region where some of the, the plants like, like peppers, for instance, peppers can be left in the ground in warmer regions and then they'll come back the next year and, and become essentially a perennial plant. We treat so many plants in our garden as annuals and there are many that can be considered weather permitting and as long as it matches your climate that could become perennial or semi-perennial just by leaving them in the ground. So that's a great way to learn about what you've got and what your, your abilities are within the garden. Tim Collins, hello to you in Portland. Do leaves local to the fruit support that fruit for energy or is it mostly a systemic effort for the plant? So it's a little bit of both. And so one of the nice things about leaves in particular is that they do add a mineral component that you might not get in compost. And so the, the trees that are growing in all of our different regions will take nutrients from the soil and goes up through the trunk, into the branches, into the leaves. And yes, there will be a, a difference from one tree leaf to another based on how they grow. And if you can use local leaves, then the nutrients that they're taking from your local soil that are then spread up into the branches and the leaves by mulching with those leaves, you will be returning some of those nutrients back into the soil. That's one way to try to overcome a deficiency in any particular type of nutrient. It's not as prevalent in trees. You see it more in vegetable gardening, whereas if you don't amend the soil in a similar way that and keep growing the same plant in that spot year after year, that soil can be depleted 
and some of the very specific nutrients that some plants need more abundance of. And so by using a, a local leaf it, from a fruit tree, it is supporting the soil locally. Generally though, there isn't that big a difference and it's really more of a feeding the soil organisms. It's the soil organisms that will release those nutrients and make them available to the plant. And so it is mostly a systemic effort between all the breakdown of the leaves, the grasses, everything that's blowing through your area that lands on the soil and gets broken down by the soil organisms. And then those are the nutrients that are systemically picked up by the roots and drawn up into the plant. But you can try to, to game the system a little bit and, and put some of those specific nutrients back into the soil. It, it's, it's not an overnight kind of thing. The leaves that you'll be using as a mulch this year might not be broken down and those nutrients made available for two, three, four years. But if you're doing it on a regular basis, that's how forests and, and large swaths of a particular tree can grow so well without depleting the soil because they're dropping their leaves and their needles and that's being basically recycled into the soil over a very long period of time. And we just try to do that on a much smaller and quicker scale in our garden by making our own compost and adding compost to the soil. But nature has it figured out and it's been doing it that way for a long, long time. Two gals is saying, I got my first rhubarb plant. Good for you. I love it. It's a smallish pot and packed in what looks like mud. I have a huge pot to plant it in. What kind of soil should I pot it up with? So rhubarb uh, likes a well-draining soil. The, the, the rhubarb is really hard to kill. I love rhubarb because it is an iron plant. But if the crown of the rhubarb plant gets wet and stays wet, it can rot. And that's one of the surest ways to kill your rhubarb plant. So putting it in, into a well-draining soil so that that never is a possibility is really the approach to take. And so if you're doing it in a, in a pot, I would definitely use soil, real soil, even if it's a uh, a, a clay soil or a sandy soil, whatever your native soil is, do incorporate that in the pot because that will help hold all the structure together. And then incorporate compost and other organic matter. Mulch on top and you can expect that the soil layers will gradually decompress and the decomposition will cause the soil layer to, to drop. Just recognize in the future that when you add more mulch to the top, careful about covering up that crown of the rhubarb and drowning it in too much moisture. But good draining soil, this is one of those situations uh, where like ver vermiculite and perlite along with your own native soil will help reduce the amount that the, the soil settles in the pot. And then you just add compost on a regular basis and it should be fine. But uh, rhubarb is good. I'm, I'm hoping uh, having been gone all week, I need to get out and take a look because I think my rhubarb is getting real close to harvest and I'm planning on doing a video about harvesting rhubarb and how to use it to include making rhubarb jelly since that's one of my favorites that I like to do and we'll, we'll move on from there. Um, keep your fingers crossed. Rhubarb is one of those plants that when you plant it, you should wait a few years before you harvest it because you want to get a really good root development. When you're pulling off the leaves and using them, it's like asparagus. You need to give it time to get set up and established before you, you do your harvesting. Joni's wondering, I rotate my beds and plan to put my peppers where I grew potatoes last year. I must have missed a few potatoes because a few are coming up. Can pepper survive next to potatoes? Yeah, I, I did the same thing. I've talked about this in recent weeks where I put my potato soil in my greenhouse last year, actually almost two years ago now. And, and last year I had potatoes coming up. I grew peppers in that bed. 
I put the peppers in and after peppers came in, that's when the potatoes started coming up. The, the biggest issue is that the, the potatoes can end up taking up a lot of space and they might try to block out and shove the peppers to the side and shade them. And so you have to prioritize which is more important, the potatoes that are coming up or the peppers that you put in there. And I was I ended up digging up potatoes early because they were interfering with my peppers. But they can grow side by side. You just have to recognize that the, the potato is more of a bully and doesn't really care that the pepper plant is there. And so if your peppers aren't doing as well as you had hoped, it might be because you allowed the, the potatoes to grow right next to them. So one of those things to, to consider about uh, along those lines. Um, so while I'm thinking about it, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to talk about visiting other gardens today. This is uh, a garden from Gilles Leger. That's how I pronounce it. I hope that's how you pronounce it, Gilles or Gilles. And uh, it's so nice to see all of the plants growing, all of this green. But I, I also wanted to show this today, as always, just to give you some ideas and maybe some things that you could do. You can see that there's a lot of raised bed gardening going on in this space. But if you look in the back, you can also see there's in-ground beds that are growing. And then I like, I really like this right in the middle as a focal point, but as a way to take best use of the space is container growing. And so to have a garden with containers and in-ground beds and raised beds, I really like it when gardeners take this approach, especially if you're growing the same plant in different beds to, to really get a good feel for which type of bed a plant prefers. You can grow just about anything in a container or a raised bed or in the ground, but there are plants that do prefer one over the other based on your soil and based on your weather. And so a garden like this is just a, a great opportunity to learn some of those things. But you can see you can see trellises that are scattered around this space. I like the path running around it with just a nice little rope border that delineates the garden from the rest of the, the, the plots that are in this section. So um, just really nice to, to see this. And, and, and if I remember right, um, this isn't all um, Gilles' garden. I, I think this was a, a community plot, and that's why you see the ropes that are separating the different sections. So I saw that you were on today. You can correct me if I if I don't remember your, your email completely as to how all of this is laid out, but just a beautiful spot. I love seeing uh, the different beds and how they're put together, different sizes, different shapes, the square beds, the rectangular beds, the containers, and then all the rest. And of course, the high fence that runs all the way around, probably to keep deer and some of those animals out. And then tucked in the back corner, and this is usually where you would find it tucked, is where you pile your compost and your mulch. And that's that's the way I do it. That's the way a lot of gardeners do it. So if you're new to gardening, and you're trying to figure out how to lay out your garden, yeah, definitely plan for your compost pile and your mulch pile and sticking it in a back corner is a great way to, to add it to your garden plan. I, I've known gardeners that fill the space and then realize they don't have a compost pile and they don't know where they're gonna put their compost pile. Compost pile is among the very first things I put on my garden plan and then add the rest of the beds and the rest of the garden, not around the compost pile, but from there. I choose the compost spot first based on where I'm planning to put the rest of the beds, but I try to get the compost cooking as early as possible. So thank you for sharing this. I hope it's giving those of us who don't have much growing yet a good sign of green and good growth and may also give some ideas you can see there's lots of space around these beds to work. There's lots of space to get a garden cart or a wheelbarrow in because raised beds that are, are high do take a lot of work to fill. 
And then of course, a big garden like this takes a lot of work to harvest. So building the beds wide enough so you can get your cart in and out to either fill the bed or maintain the bed or take the harvest out is a good idea. And then you can also see just off to the side, I was talking about containers, grow bags. Looks like some type of squash growing in the grow bags right along the edge of the garden. So uh, lots of lots to see in a good, healthy garden like this. Uh, I appreciate you sharing it with me. It's always nice to, to see the, the things that others are doing. And so when I walk through a garden like this, it gives me ideas of not only how the garden is is designed and built but also for the plants and you can see you know this is this is how i garden most you can see uh, one bed that is made up entirely of uh, looks like those are probably onions it might be garlic you've got uh, a bed like right here in front that obviously has a blend maybe some carrots some lettuces some lettuces some cabbage you can blend things you can see a bed like that in the back with a blend of pan plants. And then you have a bed like this that might be an entire bed of peppers. And so that's one of those things I like to see how other gardeners do as well. How are they planning the plants within the garden? Are they doing all one type of plant in a bed or are they mixing it up? And so when you visit someone else's garden, make note of those kind of things and be sure to ask those kind of questions. Do you find more success when you put all of your pepper plants in one bed or if you grow potatoes and peppers together in a bed, which gives you the better results? And when you get that kind of information from other gardeners, it really can make a difference in your success because you're choosing what works for someone else near you and it's worth giving it a try. Okay, so um, Tuloco16 is asking, I had issues with deformed seedlings under one of my lights. The other on the other side was okay. The problem light had sunflower starts. I know they are allelopathic, but is that bad? So yeah, so allelopathic uh, is, is what some plants are. And in this case, what the sunflowers are definitely allelopathic. And what that means is those type of plants will secrete a chemical, usually through their roots, that hinders the growth of other plants. And so when you're growing sunflowers, notice, this is one of those things to observe, you'll see that there usually aren't other plants growing right next to or right around those sunflower plants because they're allelopathic. They're, they're killing other seedlings that would be growing in that space. And so is it bad? Well, it's definitely educational. It's definitely one of those things that, that you've learned from. And yes, you probably shouldn't be starting other seedlings right next to sunflower seedlings because it can stunt or prevent the germination or growth of those seedlings that are growing right next to the sunflowers. So. Not, not a big deal. Hopefully you've got time to recover and maybe put some other starts in another area, but that's, that's probably what, you, what you're seeing is that the, the sunflower plants, they're, they're bullies too. They'll, they'll take over that spot and keep other plants from coming in. And by being aware of that, you can avoid it in the future when you're growing your plants. But it's one of those things that you can you can also use to your benefit because when you're trying to get a sunflower bed going, you don't have to worry about weeding as much because the sunflowers can actually take care of some of those weeds. Uh, so Jeremy says, even a wallflower can hit the like button. So stretch out those index leaves and help gardeners God. Thanks, Jeremy. I appreciate that. Yeah, if you're benefiting from this live stream, definitely hit the like button. Button. YouTube likes to see the the like button hit at every opportunity. So I definitely uh, appreciate that. That's one of those things. I, I don't do this for the, the like and thumbs up, but sure, by all means, go for it. <clears throat> Lauren asks, how do you store your worm castings, Gardner Scott? So I store them in a separate tub and I, I, have, I don't have holes in it, but I take the top off 
and mix it up on a fairly regular basis basis to keep it moist. And one of the nice things about worm castings is all the bacterial activity that's happening in those worm castings. So I don't like it to dry out. I like it to stay lightly moist. So I store it in plastic with a loose cover so that it, it stays as moist as possible. And you can definitely allow it to dry out. If you buy worm castings, in a bag from some producer, it's more likely than not going to be dry. And it's got all the nutrients when it's dry. But I like not only the nutrients in the worm castings, I like the, the bacteria that are in those worm castings as well when I add it to, to my soil. So I, I try to keep it moist, but that's not uh, absolute uh, necessity. Greenleaf Gardening is wondering about strawberries. Any tips? Grow them. Yes, absolutely. Grow strawberries. And I've talked about this in recent weeks as well. They have a they have a lifespan of about three years. So when you grow strawberries, anticipate they will come back next year and the year after and the year after. But the fruit production will fade after a couple years. So anticipate that. Plan for that. Recognize that you're going to need to replace your strawberry plants at about year two or three. And I just let the runners flow out, put a little pot underneath it, staple the runner into the soil of that pot, let it root, and now that's the plant I use to extend the, the life of that bed. And so then I'll dig up the older plants and put in those younger plants and just keep it growing. And one of the nice things we're talking about amending the soil and adding nutrients in a bed that plants are actively growing in, I effectively am amending my strawberry beds once every three years. As I'm digging up the older plants, I'm adding compost and mixing it into the soil at that point when I add the new strawberries into it. Strawberries are also like rhubarb with the crown of the plant. Don't smother your strawberry with mulch or soil to the point that that crown gets wet and stays wet and rots. That's a good way to, to kill your strawberry plant. But there you go. There's a couple tips for strawberries that might make it a little bit easier for you. Sherry's saying, I've discovered I have a large stand of Russian thistle, which is incredibly invasive here. Your thoughts? I, I'd try to get rid of it as much as possible. It, it does benefit some insects. And it can be a plant that can be grown in your garden with, with a little bit of care, but it can escape and it can take over. And especially if it's already identified as invasive in your area, I, I would suggest trying to at least lessen the amount of plants. Keep them from seeding so that the seeds don't spread. And if you're trying to get it under control, that's the best way to get it under control. But that... that holds true for most plants that might initially be beneficial in our garden but if you allow to spread they can just take over and so you want to try to deal with it before it takes over and so if you've got what a large stand right now better deal with it now before it becomes just so big that you can't deal with it so that would be my suggestion is just to deal with it now if you can Vanessa's Garden, a new member to the Gardener Scout community membership. So thank you, Vanessa's Garden. We'll look forward to seeing you on some of those chats that, that we like to have in our group as well. Linda's saying, you inspired me to make my first jelly and jam last year. I made rhubarb raspberry jelly. Yum. Oh, that sounds so good. I, I, I like making rhubarb jelly at the time I'm harvesting the rhubarb. This year I am planning on... To saving some of the rhubarb juice to start making some blends of jams and jellies later in the season. So I haven't made rhubarb raspberry jelly, uh, but that actually sounds pretty good. And this year I'm hoping to have enough raspberries to make raspberry jelly. I normally make raspberry jam. It takes more raspberries to make raspberry jelly, but I kind of like that idea of rhubarb and and raspberry so i'll let you know at the end of the season if that's something i was able to do uh, but good for you yeah jam and jelly making is just one of those things i i just love doing and it's one of those uh, 
the more you do it, the easier it becomes. So last year, I gave out, I gave most of my jams and jellies out as gifts, and in one afternoon, I think I did forty-two jars of jams and jellies in just over an afternoon because. I've done it so often that while one batch is finishing, I'm already starting the second batch. And for me, I process the, the jam and jelly for 20 minutes in a water bath canner. And so it's, it's a rolling 20 minute window. And so while one batch is in the water bath canner, I'm starting another batch of, of the juice and the sugar and the pectin in another pot. And then I take one set of jars out and put the other set of jars in. And you can make a lot of jam and jelly in a relatively short period of time with practice and with that experience. First time out, it's going to take longer, but do it and then do more of it so you can reach that point that it becomes so easy that you can't think of doing anything else but making jam and jelly every year. So at least one afternoon every season, I set aside to just make a big batch depending on what I'm doing. Last year I did a lot of the um, peaches from Palisade Peaches on the other side of the mountains here in Colorado. So there's Gilles says, right behind you is our flat five plots in this garden and the high fence surrounds the entire community garden. So thank you for that. That's that's what I remembered you saying. So I'm, I'm glad you, you were able to, to point that out specifically that behind me are five different plots and but you can see a lot of similarities in how they're laid out <clears throat> high plains drifter will sand help heavy soil to drain or will it make it heavier have several wicking tubs with heavy soil looking to help them with drain without breaking my wallet so yeah um, sand will make it heavier if you think about the you have to think about the soil structure and you have to think about the texture of the ingredients within that structure. So clay is really, really fine particles. And sand is a really, really large particle. And so you would think, and a lot of gardeners make this mistake, that by adding the large particle of that sand, that it breaks apart the soil and makes it drain easier. Well, what happens, is those really, really small particles of clay fill all of the crevices and all of the any pores that might be part of that sandy soil. And in, instead of having the, the good draining soil of just nothing but sand, you now have a really packed soil of the sand that is keeping everything clumped together. And then those, those clay particles that are just filling all that space so it's nothing but one solid mass so don't use sand in an effort to to make a clay soil drain better instead that organic matter is the answer the, the compost all the other organics that you can put into soil is a much better answer when you're trying to improve the drainage now if you have a wicking tub the, I, I like to use vermiculite over perlite because vermiculite can hold onto some water, but vermiculite can also aid in the, the drainage and it, it literally lightens the soil because vermiculite is so light and that can help improve the drainage. But if it's a clay soil, a really heavy clay soil, even vermiculite isn't gonna make that big a, a difference because it, just like the clay, it's gonna be inundated by those really, really small clay particles. But by mixing something like vermiculite and compost into a, a wicking tub, first off, a wicking tub, you you want the the soil to absorb and hold on to the moisture. And compost is a great way to help the capillary action within that, that wicking tub to have a consistent moist soil. So that I, I, I always, I've said this before as well, I, I always recommend the organic matter as, as a good way to, to make that work. Tim's wondering, does it make sense to line your raised beds with landscape fabric before filling with soil? I don't. 
I, I like to have my soil exposed to the air for oxygen exchange, even on the sides of a, of a bed, air is going to work its way in. And depending on what kind of landscape fabric you're using, it can block that air exchange from the sides of your bed. And that air is needed not only for the roots, but also the soil organisms. Depending on where you live, it may or may not make sense, but most of the time it doesn't because it can hold in excessive moisture that isn't allowed to evaporate or flow through the soil. And so that could be an issue in, in really rainy regions. But I, I think it's an extra step that really isn't necessary, especially at the bottom. I really don't like to put a landscape fabric at the bottom of the bed because I like the earthworms crawling back and forth between my native soil and between the beds. And you'll see you put on a raised bed without fabric and there'll be worms in it before you know it without you adding worms because they're migrating, they're moving, they're exploring new terrain. And if you block them out in any way, you're not going to have those earthworms in your bed. So I like to to keep landscape fabric away from uh, my raised beds generally. If you have raised beds that are growing near trees and you have the potential for the roots that are growing into those beds, that's the one time I would put a heavy landscape fabric at the bottom to keep the roots from growing up in the tree roots from growing up into the bed. But, but generally lining the bed, uh, I know some people think that if you line the inside of your bed that the wood will last longer. But what I've found is, especially if it is a plastic-based landscape fabric, it's just whole, when, the, when it does rain and, and when that wood does get wet, that fabric is actually holding that moisture right next to the wood and the wood stays wet and will actually rot faster. Whereas if it's exposed to the soil, any excess wood that's in that, or any excess moisture that's in that wood is transferred over to the soil. And, and it's actually adding plastic to the inside of a bed that can sometimes make it rot a little bit faster. But it depends on the weather. There's a lot of other factors that, that go into it and it's something to, to think about. Happy Gardener says, always so enjoyable just to listen to Gardener Scott. As I'm working, but I try to remember it through comments in the chat just to help the channel. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. I know there's a lot of people just listening along, and that's always good. I, I like to, to listen to things like this when I'm in the garden as well. So one of those things that if you're not able to watch us live and you have the opportunity to listen while you're at work, sure, do that. that that's, that's a nice viable option. You might, like Eli, you might be able to actually jump in from time to time and make a comment. Stony Gardner, a new member for the membership as well. So nice to have you along with the group. And uh, a group is growing. It's always growing. It's so nice to, to have everybody that is there and new people to come. Colorado Bird Nerd, nice to see you here on this Monday. Always looking forward to your Monday morning garden chat sessions. I'm quiet, but I'm here learning from you and all other gardeners on this live chat. Thank you for that, Colorado Bird Nerd. And I appreciate the, the contribution to the channel. Yeah, that's, you know, I'm one of those quiet listeners as well. I'll listen uh, or watch uh, live streams and videos without making comments. I, I just suck it all in as well. And so don't feel like you have to make a comment at, at any point. You know, right, right. Let's see, right now, oh, let me look at the analytics real quick. So there are over 200 people on the live stream right now, and there aren't certainly aren't 200 different people making comments. Um, but there don't need to be 200 people making comments. You can learn a lot just from what I'm talking about, and then what others are doing in the the comments as well. So it's okay to be quiet. It's okay to. To just absorb all that information. So MKN, M -K -I, I want to make a small DIY dry well in my ornamental bed to keep rainwater around longer as the bed tends to dry out in the summer. Has anyone tried this? I'd be tapping into one downspout. Um, so 
there's a couple of different ways you can approach this. One, if you want to keep the soil around. So uh, I, I've been working on this video. I just keep trying too many things and I can't get caught up. But Oya's are using ceramic pottery to essentially do the same thing, to collect water and keep it in a bed moist longer. You can do the same thing. If you have a, a terracotta pot, go ahead and put your, go ahead and do the, what you're talking about, where you do a dry well in the bottom of the bed, but go ahead and put a terracotta pot into it. Because when the water comes off that downspout, if it's just a hole, most of that water is going to drain away. Some of it will be in the bed, but most is going to drain away. But if you have the, the downspout go into a ceramic pot, now that water will seep through the pot, and, and that tends to be a pretty effective way at holding the water into a bed. Uh, doesn't evaporate as quickly and doesn't drain as quickly, and that, that might be an approach to take. But by all means, use use something to help collect the water and a, a dry well is one option but the the terracotta might be something to think about because uh i i have done that before in my dry region and and it can make a big difference when you're trying to keep your your soil moist and my soil tends to be pretty sandy so it drains quickly if you have a clay soil uh you can still do the terracotta pot it's just not going to drain and dry out uh, much at all because the clay is going to hold the moisture and the pot's going to hold the moisture and it, it you may not need to water much at all which can be a good thing so that's one of those things to 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 add to your plan as you figure out what you're going to do in a particular bed is what kind of soil top you have is it sandy is it clay how often you water and i know a lot of us are doing things to try to keep the soil moist and water less often, but there's a lot of others that are actually the opposite. They have so much water, they're trying to figure out how to add drainage and get rid of, of the water. And we, we've had a few days like that recently. It's actually been nice. Haven't had to water much at all um, in the month of May because we have been having some regular water, which it's is an old pattern that I'm really glad to to see come back it, it makes a big difference <clears throat> so quick shout out to bettina hello back to you nice to have you here it's always nice to to see everybody popping up on the mondays that we have i didn't miss you all last week i i had a very very busy week and was filled with lots of activities but uh, monday as i was traveling i was sitting there thinking I should be online right now. I should be talking to all my gardening friends. So I definitely missed it and was anxious to, to get back to, to you all. So when I got back to my garden, I got back last night, so I really didn't get to observe much. But when I went out to my garden this morning and walked around to, to see what was going on, uh, my house sitter did send some pictures and, and was taking care of Mala. And so all that was good. She was taking care of my seedlings in the basement that are getting ready to go outside. But we had a couple days of some pretty heavy hail here in Colorado last week. And that's one of those things that you have the best plans. And, and I've talked about this. I've got videos about this where I've got my, my cattle panel hoops. One of the reasons I like those hoops is because they're so sturdy. When I know the hail is coming, I can go out and put the cover to protect my plants. But of course, when you're not in the garden, sometimes those storms will come through and you can't be there to protect your plants. And so what I saw is my one bed in particular where I've got lettuce and peas and I should say where I had lettuce and peas because the hail did, did a number on some of those really young seedlings that were just beginning to pop through the surface. And so, I just shrugged my shoulders. There's nothing I can do about it now. This is one of those lessons being a gardener where you just have to persevere. And I've seen some of the comments today. I've talked with a lot of gardeners over the years that something happens, usually weather, could be a pest. It could be those slimy slugs that come in and eat all your seedlings. It could be that critter that just 
pops up and eats all your spring onions. You never know what it will be. And you just got to keep moving forward. Just persevere, learn from it, try to figure out what your solution is going to be, and accept that that's part of gardening. I also noticed that my asparagus plants, the, the fronds that are starting to develop, I, I, I let almost all the spears grow this year, still a young patch. Those fronds, those leaves that had already unfurled were knocked off by the hail. There are other areas on the plants that are just beginning to leaf out, but that's telling me that those asparagus spears that should be nice and big and bushy and soaking up the sun for photosynthesis to give the energy to the roots for next year, I don't have as many leaves this year because they got knocked off by this early hail. I can anticipate next year that my asparagus crop is probably not going to be as big as I had hoped. That's what happened this year. I was hoping to have a bigger harvest than I did, but last year I had some similar issues. So now I'm thinking, should I plan something to help protect my asparagus plants from hail? I've never done that before, but I'm thinking about it now that I've had two years that the asparagus has been impacted. So as things like this happen in your garden, try to figure out what you can do about it. In most cases, you can't do anything about it after the fact other than plan for the future and, and either try to keep it from happening in the future or just go down a, a totally different course of action. I, I've done that many times where I wanted to grow a particular type of plant and just couldn't get it established because of all of these issues. And so you just abandon that idea. I guess that plant isn't going to be growing in my garden. I guess I'm going to have to figure out something else to go into that spot. That's, that's a big reason why I think going to other gardens in your area can help you on your journey. Because if you're trying to grow a plant and having difficulty with it, and then you go to other gardens and you see that nobody in your area is growing that plant, well, that's a clue that maybe it doesn't work as well as you had hoped. And so then you ask the question as you're wandering the neighborhood and, and say, hey, I don't, I notice that you're not growing this plant. I'm trying to grow it, grow it. And then they might say, oh yeah, I tried to grow that for five years, could never get it to work. And so I abandoned it. You might save yourself a little bit of effort by just rubbing elbows with other gardeners. But above all, you just gotta keep at it. Just keep doing it. The bed that I had my peas and lettuce in, well, it's ready to go. And now I'll just go ahead and sow some different seeds. I, I won't have that, that lettuce and pea crop like I had hoped for, but the, the space is available. You don't have to totally give up. You just kind of shift your calendar a little bit. And so it's still a little cool for me to put my peppers and tomatoes in the ground so that bed in particular, today, I'm planning on covering with plastic to start warming up the soil. And whereas I was planning on harvesting some of those plants in another two to three weeks, instead, I'll get some of those pepper plants in early, give them an extra two to three weeks of growth. I wasn't going to put those pepper plants in until after I'd harvested the lettuce. Well, by adding that extra little bit of heat through the plastic, I'll be able to put the transplants in sooner, which should give me bigger plants, which will give me a bigger harvest. And in the end, it actually may actually work out to my benefit because I like harvesting peppers more than I like harvesting lettuce. I've got lettuce growing down in my hydroponics. I don't have to have it in my garden. So you can see how you can reframe your your reference point as you're gardening as things happen in the garden try to avoid getting depressed or worried or stressed just take it as one of those things that happens and use it as that opportunity to learn from and modify to get the, the most success in your garden so wanted to throw that out at you because 
I, I, I kind of expected I would come back and see my plants destroyed. And so I wasn't really upset at all when I saw that that is exactly what happened. I had already anticipated what I was going to do. I would have been ecstatic if I had found that there was no damage and I was able to keep with my original plan. But that doesn't always happen, especially when you're in a challenging environment. So take that with you this week as you move forward and things don't always work the way you're hoping because for those of us in springtime and those of us that are in fall, this is the time of year that the weather patterns are changing. And those changing patterns can greatly disrupt what's happening in our garden. And most of the time you really can't plan for them, but you can definitely recover from them and have a good season as, as you move forward and have all those successes that you can share with the rest of us. And I do hope you share those the successes as we proceed through the growing season. I'll definitely be talking about my successes at every opportunity I get, and you'll probably be seeing them in a lot of different videos to come. So this week, I challenge you to get out and visit someone else's garden and then put notes in your garden journal of what you've learned from that visit. And hopefully, like happened to me this last week, I've made some good new gardener friends and we'll be able to, to have conversations in the future about our gardens uh, we've met face to face. So carry that forward, get out there, meet people, learn in other gardens, and open your own garden up for others to come visit. And guess what? I'll be back next Monday, and I hope you're here to carry on this conversation as we start our gardening week together. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.